So, Father Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity. Yes. And, Lord God, I just pray that you would anoint my lips, that you would give me wisdom, Lord, to speak what you have placed upon my heart, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would open the hearts here, Father God, that the seed of your word is planted, that you would cause an increase in their hearts, Lord God, and bring forth transformation in their lives, Lord. Help me to do in what I cannot do in my flesh, Lord. Empower me by your grace tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Isaiah 43, 7, it says, Everyone who was called by his name was created for his glory. So in the scripture, what it's showing me is that everybody who was, who was created, who, has, who was created, all humanity has a purpose. They may not know it yet, but all humanity has a purpose. And it says that everyone who was called by his name was created for his glory. So even though you may not know God or you may not be in a relationship with him, you were created for a purpose, which is to make, which is to bring him glory. This is why God created man from the beginning in his image, that we might image forth his glory. He created us to be fruitful and multiply so that the knowledge of the glory of God can fill the earth just as the waters cover the sea. Yeah. And baby, I'm going to get this right. Habakkuk Habak Habak 2.14. Yeah. We're practicing on this on a later part. My wife is the grammar friendly, so I, I just wanted to make sure I get it right for her. But I love her and I thank her for, it, for always being on. However, since the fall of man, people have refused to align themselves with this divine goal. Well, all of God's acts up until this point have been aimed at seeing it through. And it will be done whether we get with the program or not. This is God's goal. And if our lives are not in alignment with it, then we are at cross purposes with our maker. But on the other hand, nothing has inspired courage and endurance for daily living like knowing the purpose of God and filling yourself wholeheartedly in harmony with God, God's universal purpose for all humanity. Nothing has encouraged me and nourished the strength of my Christian faith like knowing God's ultimate goal for creation and discovering how to bring my heart and my behavior into alignment with this goal. I believe that when we live life for ourselves or we live life for the approval of people or trying to please others other than what God created us to live life for, which is for him, I believe we, we have this sense of, of lack in us like it's we're not living for what we were created for so we we walk around not satisfied unfulfilled um without a purpose so when we go through th things like trials and tribulations and difficulty we have no hope because there's nothing bigger than us that we're yeah. living for yeah. you feel what i'm saying yeah. so um we have to get into alignment with this because it's it's, it's not only for for god's benefit but for your benefit there's so many people, if we look in Hollywood and all these big stars and stuff, that's killing themselves mm -hmm. because they have no purpose. They have no fulfillment. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's nothing greater than them that, greater than them that they're living for. Mm -hmm. They're living for themselves, for money, power, fame. All those things are empty in comparison to Jesus and the purpose that he has for them. Yeah. So this is why I'm here today to encourage someone to not waste your life living for yourself people pleasing or for people's approval but to live for the glory of God alone this was Jesus focus living for his father's glory was his top priority not the approval of man his, himself nor people pleasing and as I was writing this I thought about how the Jews were expecting Jesus to come as this ruling king to overthrow Rome but he didn't come like that he came as a suffering servant which was totally unexpected by them because they were expecting something so much greater but he came as something totally different he didn't come for people's approval. He didn't come to live life for uh, to please people. He came to live life for the glory of his father. Yeah. He didn't care about what people thought. And as and as I was writing this, my whole purpose in creating this and, and doing this message is because I was a Christian and I'm I'm still going through the season where God is just showing me who I am. And he's he's ripping off those lies that people have spoken over my life about things that, oh, Chris, you can't do this, you can't think this way, you can't wear this, or just something that 
it tore me down as a, a human being. You know what I'm saying? It, tore, it, it wounded my soul. You know what I'm saying? So God is in the seasons just ripping those things off of me. Right. And, and, and as he ripped layer by layer, I'm starting to find a, the part of me to give me boldness. Yeah. It gives me boldness when he shows me who I really am right. in his eyes and right. his love, his love for me right. and how he loves me. Yeah. He, he loves me. He loves me so much. It's like people don't know who I am in my fullness, but God, God knows me like nobody else, but he yet and still, right. he still loves me. Yeah. And that just gives me so much courage and confidence to walk in who God is calling me to be because I know God is going to love me no matter what. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And um, right. so this whole purpose of me creating this and, and doing this message is because I was this person who, in the grand scheme of things of this whole church arena, I didn't know what part I played. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't know my part. Right. And as God has been revealing me my identity and who I am in him, I know the lane I'm supposed to be in. All right. All right. So my desire is for evangelism. And God has been using that desire right. to bring him glory. Right. So this is what I'm walking in now. I'm walking in and in, in, in sharing the gospel. And then that may be simple to a lot of y'all. And y'all might be like, oh, this is what Jesus told us to do. But it's not. It's not simple to me. I feel like this is what really God has created me for, and this is my lane when it comes to this whole okay. church thing. You feel what I'm saying? But I was that purpose. I was that person who didn't, I really felt like I didn't have a purpose. You feel what I'm saying? I, yeah. I felt like there was nothing, God had nothing planned for me. I was hearing what other people were saying I was supposed to do, but I didn't know what God created me for specifically. You feel what I'm saying? And so, what I want to encourage you guys tonight to do is, is just get with God. Don't, don't take what people have to say about what your purpose is. Get with God and let him tell you what your purpose is. And you walk in that boldly. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is what I wanted to talk about tonight. Because Jesus, he wasn't phased about none of these things. None of the things people were saying. He wanted to live life for his, his father's glory. His every thought, word, and deed was totally devoted to the glory of God. Jesus was a man fully committed to the word, God's will, and ultimately his glory, even though it cost him big time. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew what was to come. He knew he would have to take the sins of the world on himself. He knew he wanted to be delivered from this horrible death, but he understood why God sent him, and he willingly chose to give up his life so that we could be saved. Jesus denied himself in order to obey the Father and bring in glory to his name. Likewise, living for God's glory will cost us. We are even promised that difficulty will come if we want to pursue righteousness and are fully committed to living godly lives in Christ. But just like Jesus, we too are called to obey whatever the Father asks because we were created to do his will and bring glory to his name, no matter the cost. So living for God's glory is not just this easy walk through the park, it's finna be a breeze type thing. It's gonna cost you something. Come on. And you're gonna have to deny yourself. Yeah. You're going to have to pick up your cross and follow him daily. Yeah. And Jesus said, if you can't do this, you can't be his disciple. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. And if we think about Luke 14, when Jesus was doing all those miracles and stuff and feeding all and feeding the 5,000 or whatever he was doing, people were coming to him and following him. He had this big crowd and his following. But in Luke 14, where the discipleship was tested and the crowd was following, Jesus turned around and, and said, start talking like, if you don't hate your father, if you don't hate your mother, all these things, then you can't be his disciple. And I feel like so many people want to follow Jesus for what he's doing or what he can do for them, rather than denying themselves, giving up their life, and doing something for him, serving him, serving his heart. So many people want his hand, but not his heart. Every everybody is everybody wants gimme gimme gimme, but nobody wants to give of themselves. So Jesus gives them the worst before he gives them the best to test their heart if they were really for him or for what he can do for them. So in being Jesus' disciple and living for God's glory, I'm not trying to put it out there like this thing is easy. There will be some times you have to sacrifice and there will be some times you have to deny your flesh in whatever way that may look. Jesus denied himself, as I stated, 
and he obeyed his father so that his father may be glorified. And we know the sacrifice that Jesus paid to save us from our sins and to put us right in right relationship with God. It was hard. It wasn't easy. So what makes us think that it's going to be easy for us? What is the glory of God? If you spend much time in church, you hear glory to God or you hear God's glory mentioned all the time. The Bible tells us that we should glorify God in all that we do, according to 1 Corinthians 10.31. But have you ever wondered what the glory of God really is? When we speak of God's glory, what are we talking about? When I think of the glory of the Lord, I think of an image of a brilliant light. The image of a brilliant light often comes to mind. I believe that this is certainly appropriate as scripture often describes the glory of God in terms of a light that shines brighter than anything on earth we have ever experienced. But let me try my best with my finite mind to describe the glory of this infinite God. And I'm going to just jump over to Ezekiel 10.4 real fast. Ezekiel 10, 4, and it reads, Then the glory and the brilliance of the Lord moved upward from the cherubim to rest over the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the, and the country yard, and the courtyard was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. The word translated here as glory is kavod in Hebrew. The meaning of this word is importance, weight, or heaviness. But primarily, kavod means reputation, honor, and majesty. It is from the use of these words that we get the meaning of glory. God's glory is God's weightiness and wonderful qualities such as beauty, goodness, love, justice, holiness, mercy, grace, wisdom, power, and so much more. When it comes to these characteristics and so many others, God has them in super abundance. Now, let's talk about a few for a minute just to get a picture of who God is and what makes what makes God glorious? The first one I like to talk about is God's holiness. The word holiness refers to his separateness, his otherness, the fact that he is unlike any other being. It indicates he is complete and infinite perfection. His holiness is the attribute of God that binds all others together. That God is holy means he is endlessly and always perfect. God's holiness pervades his entire being and shapes all his attributes. His love is a holy love, and his mercy is a holy mercy. And even his anger and wrath are holy anger and holy wrath. And this may be a hard concept for us to grasp, but this doesn't make God any less God. Because a God we can fully understand in his entirety is not a God at all. We must not use the limitation of our knowledge about God and what he does in our life as an excuse to reject his claim on our However, as we talk about God's holiness, we cannot leave out the fact that God calls us to be holy yeah. as he is holy. Right. And, the, and if we're living for God's glory, to be holy is glorifying God. Yeah. To be holy refers to a state of being, a set apart from defilement. It comes from the Hebrew word kadash. I was trying to pronounce this word. I practice it over. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, don't, don't, don't throw no stones. <laughs> Which means separateness or apartness. When something is holy, it is separated from its common use or held sacred, especially by vir virtue of its being clean and pure. So to be holy means that all we are and all we have belong to God, not ourselves. That every aspect of our lives is to be shaped and directed toward God. When God was calling Israel to be holy in Leviticus 11, he was instructing them to be distinct from the other nations by giving them specific regu regulations to govern their lives. Israel is God's chosen nation, and God has set them apart from other groups. They are his special people, and consequently, they were given standards to live by so people knew they belonged to him. And that's why I tell people all the time. We are God's holy nation, as it talks about in 1 Peter 2, 9, 2. And he has set us apart from the world. And we're called to be holy, which means to be set apart. Um, 
And God has given us commands in this word to set us apart to show people who we belong to, just as he did Israel. He gave them standards to live by, and God also gave us standards to live by. But sometimes most people look at, look at those things as God taking the fun out of their lives. But, it's, but, but the thing about it is, is God gives us standards from him so we won't look like everybody else. Because how are we going to draw anybody to him if we look the same as them? So it's actually his standards and his commands and his word that, that most people don't like. It actually benefits us because it draws people to him. And what did I say in the beginning? We're making God's glory known and we're leading others to him. So in order to lead others to him, we have to obey the standards that he gives us. Come on. We're not here to look like everybody else. Come on. We're here to look like Christ. Yep. So when Peter speaks on this in 1 Peter 1.16, he is talking to us believers and commanding us to be holy as God is holy. But to be holy, we must, be, we must as believers be set apart from the world. Also, we need to be living by God's standard and not the world. God is calling us to be distinct from the world. We are a holy nation and we are separated from the world once we are saved. This is true. And God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light to proclaim the praises of the one who has chosen and called us. First Peter 2 9. So we need to live out of this reality in our day to day lives, which Peter tells us how to do in first Peter 13 and 14. And I would like to go there. I'm reading out an amplified version. So 1 Peter 1, 13, it says, So prepare your minds for action. Be completely sober in spirit, steadfast, self-disciplined, spiritually and morally alert. Fix your hope completely on the grace of God that is coming to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Number 14, live as obedient children of God. Do not be conformed to evil desires which governed you in your ignorance before you knew the requirements and transforming power of the good news regarding salvation. And what I really want to focus on in, uh, in, in verse 13 is fix your hope completely on the grace of God. As Doc was talking about today, the grace of God. It's the grace of God that helps us to live this life that God calls us to. Come on. Yeah. And so in, in, second, in, in Titus 2, and you don't have to go there, but I just want to read that real quick. Um, in Titus 2, verses 11 through 12. It says, for the remarkable undeserved grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to reject ungodliness and worldly and moral desires and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives, lives with a purpose that re reflects spiritual maturity in this present age. So as I see here, grace is not just a saving grace or a sustaining grace, but it's an empowering grace that helps us to walk in holiness and to live a life worthy of the gospel. Amen. But first, in order to live holy, we must become holy. And holy, holiness is only a result from a right relationship with God by believing and fully trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And this is why we need Christ. Because without Christ taking a place for us and dying for our sins, we will all fall short of God's holy standard. Now, I'm not trying to be too deep tonight, but... Um, this needs to be heard. There's a lot of people dying and going to hell. And people need to hear of this good news. That Jesus paid the price so that we could be saved. So we could not keep God's holy standard. And we all fall short. We would never be able to be holy or live holy without his help. The consequences of a life lived without Christ is God's wrath. Thankfully, the Christian would never have to experience God's wrath poured out. Through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the penalty for our sins was paid, and we were credited with Christ's righteousness. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he made Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. So, J so Jesus took on our sinful, wicked lifestyle, and he gave us his, perf his perfect holiness, 
His perfect righteousness. And he put us in right standing with the Father. All we deserve was wrath and damnation and eternal separation from the Father. That's all we deserve. But yet Christ chose to die. There was nothing desirable or beautiful in us to make him die or make him want to die. There was nothing in us that was good. But he chose to because he loved us that much. Each one of us. Now when God looks on us, he sees Christ's perfect holiness and righteousness. It is only in this that we can hope to stand blameless in the presence of a holy God. Which leads me to my second one. God is just. What does it mean for God to be just? It means more than he is simply fair. It means he always does what is right and good toward all men. Likewise, although, it's, although this is hard for many to accept, his sentencing of evil, unrepented sinners to hell, is also right and good. A natural question that often arises is how then can a just God justify the unjust, as each of us are without Christ? A Christian author and preacher, A.W. Tozer, answers this in his book, The Transformed Soul. By reminding us that we find the answer through the Christian doctrine of justification and redemption. And he goes on to say, through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated, but satisfied when God spares a sinner. You see, God's mercy does not forbid his exercise. God's mercy does not forbid him to exercise his justice, nor does his justice forbid him to exercise his mercy. He is both fully merciful and fully just. In light of God's other attributes of goodness, mercy, love, and grace, there are some who might in error say God is too kind to punish the ungodly. But to believe this, we lessen the reality of his infinite, unchanging justice. And God will have justice for sin, either from Christ's atoning death or for those who will not accept him, eternal wrath and hell. See, God is not like our system this judicial system that we got here on earth. He's not like that. God's going to justice and God's going to get justice. And so all these people who, who think they can get away with doing whatever they want and spitting on the name and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God will get justice, whether it's here or whether it's later when, later when you stand before him. I think I heard, uh, was, I think it was Leonard Ravenhill said, he said, every knee will bow, yeah. rather, in, rather in awe of him yeah. or in fear of him. So you won't get away. God will have justice. Justice will be served. Which leads me to my next one, which we all need to cover us, God's mercy. What we must understand when it comes to the attributes of God is that they are inseparable of the other. God's mercy is inseparable from God's justice. This is who he is at all times. God never changes. He is infinitely, unchangeably, unfailingly merciful and forgiving. And he's lovingly kind towards us. He is inexhaustibly, actively compassionate. His mercy is also undeserved by us. Without the mercy of God, we will have no hope of heaven. Because of our sin against the holy God, we deserve death. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all has fallen short of the glory of God. And he even talks about in, Rome, in Romans 3.19 that the law is purposed to shut the mouth of those with excuses when they stand before God that they are guilty. Wow. So all those people who say, I'm a good person, um, I'm not bad, I shouldn't go to hell. The law is actually sh showing you yourself and telling you that... It's a lie. You are bad. You should go to hell. It's a mirror to show you that you are a horrible person. You're not a good person. What's the law, Brother Chris? Huh? What is the law? What is the law? Yeah. The law is God's sin commandment. And it shows us who we are. Don't lie. Don't steal. You look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Most of us have done it here, right? Use God's name in vain. 
<laughs> yeah. So we are already liars, adulterers, thieves, you know? And so the law leaves us without an excuse when we stand before God. So all that good person stuff is out the window. I don't care how many times you ran over to grandma house or next door neighbor house to give her groceries. That's good. That's good, but um, it's not good enough. God's requirement is perfection. And none of us in here can be it can be perfect. If you can, let me know. I'll talk to you after this is over. But um, Christ wouldn't have to die if we all could be perfect. At least that's what the scripture says. So, at the end of the day, none of us are good, and we are in need of God's mercy. Because apart from that, it's hell. And I mean, this is, it has to be talked about now. I feel like, I was thinking about this, I, I work at Sentai's now or whatever, and <clears throat> this guy I work with, his name's Chuck, and um, he was very bold about who he lived for, which is Satan. You know? and, um, I'm just saying the scripture says you know a tree by the fruit it bears so um, you live for Satan and he's very bold about that and I was like I just thought to myself if he could be bold about this why can't I be bold about who I live for you know what I'm saying and so he likes to talk about girls and he's very promiscuous guy you know and he's, he's like pointing me this way to look at this girl, pointing me that way to look at that girl. And I just, I just told him straight up, bro. I said, bro, I got a wife at home. I said, I got a prize at home, and my eyes is on the prize. She's right now. She's not walking around here in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, um, so we just talk, started talking about, we started talking about like marriage and stuff like that. And I got to share Jesus with him. So he, he know what I'm about. He know what I'm there for. And so the conversation is still, he still want to talk about girls. And every time I'm talking to him about Jesus. He don't want to hear it, but I'm like, I don't want to hear what you guys say either. So the more you keep talking about it, the more I'm going to keep talking about Jesus. Kind of like the more sin abound, grace abounds even more, you know. So the more he talk, the more he keep being bold about his devil, devil father, I'm going to keep being bold about my Jesus. You know what I'm saying? So... It is what it is. Um, but instead, because of the mercy of God, we get life through faith in Christ. But not only that, God goes even further. God's grace. Grace is God's choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. It is his kindness to the undeserving. Grace is a part of who God is and not just the action he bestows. It means we can trust that grace is eternal. His grace is something we do not earn or lose, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For those who repent and believe in Christ receive this saving grace. However, as I said before, it's not just a saving grace, but a sustaining and empowering grace that results in our sanctification and our glorification before God, that we might live for him and enjoy him for all eternity. And this is what eternity is. That we may know the one and only yes. true God yes. and know the one who we have sent, yes. which is Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Eternity doesn't start later, it starts now. And we have a job to do here. That's why when God saved you, as Doc say all the time, God didn't save you and take you up to heaven. He <coughs> saved you and left you here so you can change and make an impact in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is damnation. And grace is getting what we don't deserve, which is eternal life. In mercy, God chose to cancel our sin debt by Jesus' sacrifice. But by his grace, he shows his kindness to his enemies, which is us. And he offers us forgiveness, reconciliation, abundant life, eternal treasure, his Holy Spirit, and a place with him in heaven. And knowing all this about God's attributes, so now when we think of God's glory, we remember that God has all good things in greater quantity and quality. 
We must also understand that God is self-sufficient and he has no needs. And because God is self-sufficient, we can go to him to satisfy all our needs. We never have to worry about drying up his never-ending well of goodness, peace, mercy, love, and grace. Amen. This makes God's glory also solid and substantial. So to sum up what the glory of God is, the glory of God is the invisible qualities, characteristics, and attributes of God displayed in a visible or knowable way. In knowing all this about the glory of God, partly, God wants us to share his glory with the world by putting on display his attributes and characteristics. This is why the scriptures calls us to do all things for the glory of God. When we talk about living for the glory of God, this is not a call to do God a favor or make God more glorious. It is a command to align our lives with his eternal goal. Yeah. He created us to display his glory so that his glory might be known and praised. This is God's great aim at creating and governing the world, that he be glorified. So how can we glorify God? As we know that God is in need of nothing and we are not doing this to make God more glorious because God is infinitely valuable. However, through our lives, as we demonstrate through word and deed, his glorious characteristics, others will come to know of his beauty and live to glorify him as well. Modeling the character of Jesus is a way to glorify God because we are showcasing his attributes and characteristics. Colossians 1.15 tells us that Christ was the visible image of an invisible God. So to live like Christ is to be the visible image bearers of God. This is what we are called to do as Christians. Exalt the glory of God. This is what Jesus lived for. And as 1 John 2.6 says, anyone who claims to live in God must live their lives as Jesus did. So if we're not living for the glory of God, we are not living like Jesus. And I would also like to ask or what are we living for? You see, you see, glory can be thought of as a mirror that accurately reflects what is there. When we accurately reflect the character of God, we glorify him. So with that said, how can we live to glorify God? We love without hypocrisy. Deny ourselves. Offer ourselves as, offer our lives as living sacrifice which the scripture says this is a, a logical or reasonable service in comparison to what Jesus has done for us. Right now. Offering our lives as living sacrifice is a reasonable, logical, logical service because Jesus has did even more for us than we can do for him. Amen. Number four, being obedient to his commands. And number, number five, bearing fruit. John 5, 15, 8. And I want, I want to just go there real quick. John 15, 8. And it reads, it says, My Father is glorified and honored by this when you bear much fruit. Prove yourselves to be my true disciples. To bear much fruit, the reason why this glorify God is because when we bear fruit, the world can see the results of a spirit-filled life. And many of us know that the fruits of the spirit comes through the Holy Spirit. So when we bear fruit, people see the spirit's work in our lives. That is what we are here for, to put God on display to the world. That's why in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus commands us to let our light shine so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Our good works are the fruit that benefits others. When we live a life of good works, the world will see and glorify our Father. And the last one is sharing the gospel. We know that Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, he gave us this great commission. It wasn't a great, great suggestion, it was a great commission. To go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and Holy Spirit, and to teach them everything that Christ had taught them. This is what Jesus told them before he ascended. And this is the goal. This is the reason why we do children's ministry. This is the reason why we do young adults. This is the reason why we do the men's ministry. 
This is the reasons why we do women's ministry. To make disciples. To send them out. To make other disciples. And it's just a circle of life. Like the Lion King. So, that's just the way it goes. Everything points to making God known. It's just a circle of life, man. Preaching the gospel. And I'm not talking about just preaching the gospel at an event we may have here. Everybody go out and share the gospel at the mall, you know, or something like that. But it's a lifestyle. And I think I think even more so, as I've seen this week as, as Sentai, God's just been, like, blowing me up with different opportunities to speak to people about Jesus at my job. And I haven't even been bringing anything up. They have. And I've just been praying for divine appointments and opportunities to share Jesus with them. And they just been bringing up church and stuff like that. And I'm just like, all right, you sit it right there in my lap. I'll take it. So um, this is what we're here for. I don't care if you're a basketball player, whatever it is, do it all for the glory of God. And what better way to glorify God than in sharing the gospel, which God's glory is most revealed. All his attributes, all his characteristics. And something that will save a person's eternity. This is a very short life lived in comparison to eternity. So it's very important that we do this. And I think I think it's very important. I think it's very important because it was it was the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended. It's very important. It's very important that we do this. But ultimately, to glorify God is to honor him for who he is, who he really is. Honor originates in our hearts and refers to the value we personally place on something or someone. So if we value God, we show it by how we live. And when we honor God with our words and deeds, we are demonstrating the high regard we have for him. That's why we have to be conscious of the choices we make, because those choices reflect the place he has in our hearts. Our reason for living should be God's reason for us living. And as I stated before, making God's glory known and leading others to him is the goal. This is why we exist, and this is why I love Revelation 4, 11. Which says, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they exist. Because of your will, we exist, God. And were created and brought into being. The glory of God is the reason why God does everything and anything he does. God created everything through himself and for himself, Colossians 1.16. He created the world to declare his glory, Psalms 19, 1 through 4. He formed and made man with the same intent, Isaiah 43, 7. This is why he condemns anyone who dishonor his name, Exodus 27. He blesses people so his waves and saving power may be known among all the nations, so all nations will praise him, Psalms 67, 1 through 7. He will allow, he allow some people to be sick so the power of God may be known, John 9, 3. God saves people so they might live for him, 2 Corinthians 5.15 and Hebrews 9.14. Jesus died on the cross to glorify our Father in heaven, John 12, 27-28. This is why the gospel is so glorious, because the glory of God is most displayed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason I say this is because we know that the glory of God is the invisible qualities, characteristics, or attributes of God displayed in a visible or knowable way. And nothing reveals the wrath, holiness, grace, mercy, compassion, unity, sovereignty, power, purity, perfection, wisdom, and love of God like the gospel. This is why, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers because once they get a glimpse of God's glory, it will never be the same. You can't experience God's glory and remain the same. This is why we should be looking for every opportunity to share this glorious gospel and not only share it, but live it to the fullest because there are people that the enemy has blinded by money, power, pleasure, wow. drugs, temporary worldly cares, etc. that needs the light of Christ to open their eyes to see that they're headed for destruction. Wow. Yep. So as I close tonight, Good word, brother. my purpose in preaching and, and 
writing up this message, I believe God has given me, is to encourage people to live a life for the glory of God. No matter what context you may do that, do it in. Do it all for the glory of God. Man, I don't I don't flip burgers at Wendy's and I was a dishwasher at Detroit Yacht Club and all these things. And I was saved while doing it. And while doing it, I was sharing Jesus with people. It's not it doesn't matter how big your platform is. It just matters if you're doing what he told you to do. And I remember in, in a man's our one of our men's meetings, we were all defining success. And before I came into a relationship with God, my definition of success was money, cars, you know, kind of like everybody else, fame, power, all this stuff, all this junk. And so, <clears throat> but God changed that. Success, true success is obeying God in all things. True success is doing what God has told us to do. Touching a life, even if it's just one. That's true success. Because it shows you're not living life for you, but you're living life for the one who created you. Which is what you're supposed to be doing anyway. But most people are missing the mark. So tonight, I just wanted to uh, encourage people or redirect people um, to focus on the reason why God has them here. Because there's so many people searching for purpose and fulfillment in all the wrong places. But God is like, if you look at me and if you get in alignment, but why I created the world, and why I govern the world, you will find your purpose and fulfillment. You feel what I'm saying? Because that's what I had to do. I had to, I had to do the simple thing, but yet profound thing. Do all things for the glory of God, and in that, I found my place or my lane in this whole church arena. Yep. You feel what I'm saying? Yep. So it may be simple, but it yet it's profound because not only do you find purpose and it, you find your identity and God start working on you and doing things in you to help you to walk in your purpose and leading you to your, your destiny wherever that prom that destiny may be or promised land he's taking you to. You feel what I'm saying? So that's my purpose in tonight and I just wanted to pray for people. Just to lay hands on people just to um, that God would just empower you to live life for him for his glory. No matter what you may be facing, no matter what circumstance. And I, I just want to add this. No matter what you may be going through, the difficulty, it's all for God's glory. It's all for his glory. God wants to manifest his power and his love in your life so others may see that and be drawn to him. Once they see that God has brought you out of that, it's going to make them ask you or, or question you like, how did you, how did you get through that? And you share Jesus with them. You glorify God in that. So no matter, no matter the difficulty you may be facing or going through, I just want to let you know that there's grace here tonight to empower you to get through it, to live for the glory of God. It's not over. God has a purpose for you. He created us all with a purpose. And if we focus on that and get in alignment with it, we will find that purpose and find that fulfillment and bring glory to God. So if you need prayer, I would like to ask two women and one more man up here to help me pray. If that's possible, please. So if you need prayer tonight, come on up. And I just want to lay hands on you real quick. <laughs>